welcome to And So Much More. I am your host, Cammie Smith, and I actually have two guests who I love that they're here right now. They've both been on before. We have Tiffany Little, who is over patient education here at Centra, and then we have Mr. Lance Dorsley, who we don't get to spend as much time with very often, um, but he is over infection prevention. Um, thank you guys both. I know you're so busy, and I'm so thankful that you're here. Thank you for having us. Um, so we're going to have a super awkward conversation, and we're not going to make <laughs> it awkward. <laughs> um, we're going to be talking about sexually transmitted infections today. And, and it's like the thing that nobody wants to talk about. Right. Um, and, but it's also so impactful in our community, so much more so than I think anybody realizes or wants to admit. Um, so we just kind of want to educate and bring things to the surface. Um, and so just kind of join in the conversation with us. Um, but first, why don't you guys tell me both a little bit about what you do at Centra really briefly before we jump in. Let's get you started, too. Sure. Um, I'm over patient education. So anything that goes out, we make sure that it is relevant to our communities mm -hmm. and that it is meeting health literacy standards and translation standards. So we would just want to make sure that everything we put out there is really approachable and meaningful. Yeah, I love that. And I'm over the infection prevention department for Centra. And really what we aim to do is make sure, you know, f patients aren't leaving the hospital with anything they mm -hmm. didn't come in with, um, preventing hospital acquired infections, um, prevention is during surgery, and just making sure that we're following and all the best practices when it comes to creating a sanitary environment in the hospital. Yeah, I love that. And then I feel like both of you also are are very good at staying um, in front of some of these these if these information and sometimes misinformation based things that are floating through the media and social media. And so like, you know, I think everyone thought monkeypox was going to be the next COVID. And I know we had a conversation about that a few years ago. Um, and But then like the whole West Nile and the mosquitoes. And I mean, it, these are things that are a concern, but it's how do you pull the frenzy away from um, what is real and what do we need to know and, and what can we you know, let fall away. What information is just not true. Um, and so, and this is also one of those topics that um, you don't really see floating around so much on social media. But Tiffany, I know that um, one of our business partners had let us know that you were talking about just how prevalent this is in our community. So can you share a little bit about that? It is. Actually, I'm at going to give this conversation over to Lentz because okay. what we create a lot of our education based on the main reportable diseases or reasons that people come into the hospital mm -hmm. because we want to get ahead of that. If people are coming in and they're sick, how can we prevent them from being sick in the first place? Like, yeah. How can we help people live their healthiest lives? So um, based on the 2023 uh, most reportable diseases, which I'll let Lentz talk about, yeah. um, that's where we create our material and that's why we decided that we really needed to start talking about STIs. Okay. Yeah, awesome. really, um, as Tiffany mentioned, when it comes to reportable diseases, STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea, they're always one of the top four, top three yeah. um, throughout our state. Um, along with other things, you know, that are on the rise, um, alpha gal right now, yeah. something that just became a reportable, um, that we're seeing a lot of it um, yeah. in the community. We're learning it's a lot more prevalent than we thought. Wow. Um, but when it comes to STIs, particularly chlamydia, gonorrhea, those are our top two, um, top two, top three um, reportable diseases for our region. Wow. Um, again, a lot of it we find, um, you know, asymptomatic infections mm -hmm. a lot of times. Um, so okay. folks aren't necessarily presenting with symptoms every time they get infected. So mm -hmm. they might um, you know, pass it down to multiple partners mm -hmm. on the road. And by the Goodness. time um, you know, they end up in the hospital, um, they might just be at high risk you know, and then end up getting screened and um, yeah. you know, find out that they're positive for an STI. So um, definitely making, it's definitely prevalent in the community. Okay. Um, even just looking at some of the Virginia Department of Health data, mm -hmm. um, You'll, you'll really get a good idea of you know how yeah. prevalent it is a lot more than Yikes. we like to think that mm -hmm. it is. Um, again, even um, looking at the data, the, you see disparities across mm -hmm. minority groups as well. Um, you see um, high risk individuals as well showing up um, and being the ones, you know, with the highest burden of yeah. a lot of these diseases. So we definitely have a lot of work to do. I think education, mm -hmm. what Tiffany's right. team does, mm -hmm. um, is critical. Um, to really get in front of this. Yeah. Many of these diseases are also 
also silent. You know, they oh, okay. they go undetected. So a yeah. lot of times people may not know about them. And because of the sensitive nature of a, a sexually transmitted infection, people don't want to talk about it. Or they yeah. talk about it with someone that they love or they know pretty well. This may not be a healthcare professional, so that's where some of the misinformation comes from. Mm -hmm. You can yeah. look up anything on the internet, but it doesn't mean that it's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Yes, and also can lead to um, a rabbit trail yes. of <laughs> you know a direction that may not even be helpful for you. Right. So I want to talk about the data that you mentioned um, because as as I was doing some research, it's growing. Like the data, mm -hmm. the numbers are growing. Yes. What is the most recent data pool for um, what we're what we know right now concretely? Is that like 2022, 2023? So usually about 2022, 2023 okay. is where we're at. Um, we report, you know, um, STIs, most of them, uh, gonorrhea, chlamydia, mm -hmm. HIV. They're mandatory reportables for pretty much every health department in the country. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, they then go, they collect that data, um, aggregate it by zip codes and, you know, make sure that, you know, they are not duplicates and whatnot. Um, and then it takes, there's usually a gap. So right now, the most recent data we have is really um, 2022, 2023 data. Uh, might have a little bit of 2024. Yeah. Um, but what the Virginia Department of Health does, they publish an annual report for us for STDs, okay. um, chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, mm -hmm. um, congenital syphilis as well. Um, and I think maybe one or two others. Um, and it usually shows a five-year um, a five-year trend and if you do look at those five-year trends what I encourage you to do yeah. you see it's been on the rise um, yeah. COVID the pandemic has definitely mm -hmm. influenced a lot of the numbers that we're seeing um, mm. yeah it's will we ever <laughs> see the end of the impact of COVID <laughs> uh, we may be looking for these answers for years yes yes it's unbelievable and I mean some of the things that we're talking about are um, like you said they're silent and so mm -hmm. when it comes to starting, like when, because when, the numbers, or the ages rather, 15 to 49, mm -hmm. like I don't think the average 15 year old is thinking I should probably get tested for right. something. And so when you talk about the need for education, like what does that look like? Where do you start? So uh, by educating and putting education out there, that's really the first step because we really should be having these conversations with our healthcare providers and yeah. our loved ones about what we're seeing and feeling and what mm -hmm. we're experiencing. Um, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, those are our top threes. We really try and hit those hard, yeah. but they can be silent. And one of them actually has a latent period that can last 10 to 30 years. Oh my you goodness. know, it stays completely silent in your system and you may not know you have it. Can you pass it on while you it's can. dormant? Mm -hmm. okay. You can pass it on to your children or you can pass it on to your partners. Mm -hmm. And so starting with the conversations about having safe sex, no matter how, what type of sexual activities you're engaging with, having that safe conversation with your partner and talk about your history, you know, talk mm -hmm. about the things that, that really matter, not just sexually, but also, you know, the potential for diseases yeah. and for infections. Yeah. So because we're talking about some really young ages, if mm -hmm. there are any parents who are watching, um, what, what does that look like? I mean, <laughs> do you take your child to the pediatrician and have this conversation? Mm -hmm. Do you take them somewhere else? Um, are there some, um, some tactics in place for providers to maybe have these conversations with younger patients mm -hmm. um, outside of maybe having a parent present where they may not be so inclined to share. So like, how, how, does, how is that addressed? <laughs> yeah, it, you know, it can be a really sensitive topic because, you yeah. know, we, we can feel very insecure about our sexuality or our gender. Mm -hmm. And these conversations have traditionally not been ones that you have around the dinner table, you know? Yeah. So there are places that you can go and there are places for our providers to go as well to okay. help them have those conversations with their with their patients or their loved ones. Yeah. So the health department does a really amazing job, not only equipping people to have safe sex, but also to um, give them information and you know, dismantle some of that misinformation yes. that's out there. The World Health Organization and the CDC both put out information on how providers can have conversations with their patients okay. and with family members of patients too, because these topics can be hard to navigate, but they don't have to be. So yeah. there is also education on how to have the supportive conversations because we do want to open the doors because as we open doors and have conversations, uh -huh. we are eliminating risks. Yeah. 
Um, this might be a bit of a rabbit trail, <laughs> but I mean, you think of um, of our patients, and and there it's never just one area that is touched by a patient when they come in. It's often different service lines that they may interact with. Um, but also ahead of it, like I think about, I would hope that my kids would be able to talk yeah. to me about these things. But something that we've chosen to do is we we don't have a lot of family in the area, um, but we have chosen and really developed relationships with adults that we trust. Mm -hmm. And we have very um, intentionally encouraged the relationship between them and our kids as well. So you know, maybe they may not be so comfortable coming to me about something, but maybe they'll go to Miss Carrie, or maybe they'll go to Mr. Peter, or these people in their lives who, um, you know, we want, we want there to be a safe space somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so as you are talking to, you know, people who could be potential patients, there's so much education there. But what about some of that ahead? I mean, I guess that might fall under prevention mm -hmm. in a way, but like, what does that look like? Like to start, because I know you do a lot of um, encouraging conversation in the mm -hmm. community like let's talk about this yes. more and, and and encourage all of us together so how would you encourage that type of environment there is a lot of freedom in being evidence-based and data-driven yeah because you don't have to make up the answers then you don't yeah. have to make up storylines or even feel afraid that what you're saying is incorrect yeah um, because we know that the evidence supports that not talking about things does not lead to prevention. Mm -hmm. So having open conversations, you know, even if they feel uncomfortable, it's okay. You can come at it from a clinical standpoint. You can yeah. have the data behind you and you can say, I'm not here to judge anything that's going on. You know, who you are is who I love and we're love just gonna that. have this conversation. Yeah, I love that so much. Um, and it's so important, no matter what age that you are, that whether it is an adult, like a trusted adult mm -hmm. in your life or your parent, or, or if it is your provider, you know, we talk on this podcast all the time about the importance of a direct relationship with your primary care um, and, and telling them what's going on. And we had actually a great conversation with one of our primary care physicians and they talked about like, tell us the truth, please. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, we want to be a part of like your growth and your life and your healthy aspects of your life, um, but we can only help you as, as much as you right. let us in. And so, yeah, those conversations are so vital. Um, and, and early, you know, they can, you can catch things a lot earlier if mm -hmm. your primary care provider is already on that journey with you. They can right. notice the changes that are happening. Um, they, so, they, oh, can sorry, also, they can also help support you in wherever you're going from here. You know, yes. if they know the truth, mm -hmm. they can help support you and how to prevent whatever risk factors might be coming with that mm -hmm. or, you know, help support you in how to navigate it better. Yes, yes. And I think those relationships with providers is key because there's a lot of misconception out there, especially among younger individuals mm -hmm. at 15 yeah. to 24 age group. You know, a lot of it, um, they think, hey, you know, I've, I've, I'm a virgin. I've never... Mm -hmm. you know, have sex before, so I'm not at risk for an STD, but, you know, provider can be there and say, hey, wait, let's define what being yes. a virgin actually means to you, because, you know, oral sex and anal mm -hmm. sex, and there's just con sexual contact can mm -hmm. um, lead to transmission of diseases right. um, and be asymptomatic at all, so yeah. um, a lot of these STDs, we like to think of them as just affecting, um, you know, our reproductive systems or genital mm -hmm. area, but um, they can spread to our, our throats, our mouths. Right. Um, mm. Gonorrhea, in particular, um, can can spread from the mucous membranes down to mm -hmm. um, other body sites, um, wow. um, even causing you know arthritis, showing up as arthritis right. in, in some cases, or meningitis or other or other parts of the body. So, yeah. um, ha being able to have a provider, where you can mm -hmm. have go to as a true source of hey, I can trust this individual. He's a um, yeah, I've got, I see my primary care physician, I seek mm -hmm. care from him, um, and establishing that trust, I think that's important as well. Yes, and um, you that was going to be one of my questions, like what are the symptoms, like what do you look for, um, and, and I know the answer is like have the conversation, <laughs> but you know, for people who are like, you know, oh, you know, this, this isn't that big of a deal, like mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm going to wait, or like, what are the symptoms? What can mm -hmm. you look for? And then maybe what are some things that are mistaken as symptoms or as things that you shouldn't worry about? So it's uh, interesting you bring up symptoms. The majority mm -hmm. of STI infections are asymptomatic. Right. Crazy. Like you were talking about the <laughs> silent. <laughs> uh. So 
uh, when we do talk about symptoms, we're talking about the minority of individuals that do mm -hmm. get infections. Okay. Um, other add to that too, a lot of the symptoms, um, you know, they sh they're the same across mo most of the diseases, gonorrhea, mm -hmm. um, um, chlamydia, and you get the mm -hmm. discharge as well. Mm -hmm. um, and men, um, particularly, um, gonorrhea may not be as um, men and women um, actually both. Uh, might not be asymptomatic at all. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the usual, you know, that we, that, you know, folks are used to hearing about the penile discharge mm -hmm. or the vaginal discharge, um, burning, um, right. and, but, you know, those are some of the common pretty obvious rare. signs. Yeah, but, you know, you can also have a fever, mm -hmm. you yeah. know, and you might think, oh, you know. And how many times do we shrug off a fever? You, know, you get it's, Tylenol or something. Exactly, exactly. And, Take a nap. <laughs> it can look like a lot of things. Yeah. You know, you will have the discharge, you will have the burning mm -hmm. with urination, but that's not always. And then syphilis, it can be a sore mm -hmm. or um, an ulcer mm -hmm. somewhere on your body that may not hurt at all. Yeah. Um, and that's only in the first stages and they may not happen right away. So a lot of people think that they've had sexual contact, that something might happen right away. They'll know yeah. right away. And that can oft oftentimes be two, three weeks, sometimes months before they actually wow. demonstrate any symptom at all. Yeah. yeah. So is the message, if you're choosing to be sexually active, no matter your age, mm -hmm. start testing. And, and, and how do, like if I'm, if I'm a patient, do I just go to my primary care and say, hey, I would like to be tested? What does that process look like? Just to kind of break it down for someone who needs a very simple, <laughs> what do I do right now? So always practice safe sex, mm -hmm. always. Any sexual contact, and like Lentz was saying, it's not always, you know, it's not always the sexual activity that you expect. You know, it can mm -hmm. be oral sex. It's it can not always be, intercourse. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. It can be any, any means by which we have it. So okay. practice safe sex anyway. Okay. Um, if you do want to be tested, there are lots of appointments available through the Virginia Department of Health. Okay. And we have a location here in Lynchburg and some of our surrounding um, areas. Okay. Um, you can go there for testings. You know, no questions asked. They will even help equip you with wow. um, condoms, dental dams, or whatever you need to yeah. st stay safe. And then you can also go to your primary care provider. Now, sometimes those appointments can be far off. Mm -hmm. You can go to urgent care or to our clinics um, and be seen right away if you have concerns about being tested. But have those conversations early with your partners, you know, about, yeah. you know, what is safe and what is, you know, where your boundaries are. It's always healthy to have boundaries. Yes. Yes. That's so good. Um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, but when it comes to like treatment and you mm -hmm. and what you got all actually both of you have said is um, some of this will stay a part of your life for years, mm -hmm. whether you know that you have it or not. So are there treatments? Are they are they um, what's the word I'm looking for? Sorry. Effective. Effective. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So are there treatments? Are they effective? Um, what, what can somebody do if they find mm -hmm. themselves? Yeah. So there are treatments. Um, as, um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, there's antibiotics that we can give mm -hmm. um, that work very well. Um, HPV, we have vaccinations mm -hmm. to prevent um, okay. um, HPV disease, and it, which could lead to cervical cancer down right. the road. Mm -hmm. um, syphilis as well, you know, you can pass it down mm -hmm. to the baby as well. Um, so we do have treatments that are effective, not, um, not for all STDs, you know. Um, HIV again. We have treatments mm -hmm. that are effective, but we know we don't necessarily have a cure. Yeah. Um, to you know, cure something against a lifelong disease that you'll be battling with. But yeah. um, the difficult part is a lot of these infections again are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. So folks don't necessarily say, "I'm fine." You know. Yeah. Um, it's been three months. They shrug it off. Shrug it off. Yeah. Um, so they would go a lot of times without seeking treatment until. Mm -hmm. Um, by the time they eventually make it to uh, uh, see a provider, you know, the disease might have already progressed or it might be a more difficult to treat at that mm -hmm. point um, than if they would have caught it early. Um, the other yeah. thing we're seeing as well is, you know, there's emerging resistance with right. a lot of our existing antibiotics for um, STI. So, oh, right. um, you know, what's effective today may not always be effective down the road. Okay. So, Kind of where we're at with the treatment yeah, right now. Yeah, this is kind of an ever-evolving situation. It sounds like, as with most, I think mm -hmm. that you know, t it, things are just changing. Um, and but I think that more conversation can only help. Mm -hmm. um, what what type of research, if you if you guys 
can speak to it is being done. If, if things are changing and treatments are becoming ineffective over time, what types of research is being done surrounding this? Anything that's being treated by antibiotics can develop uh, resistance. Any bacteria, bacteria are very smart. Mm -hmm. They know how to continually adapt and it's actually really fascinating uh, what bacteria can do. But because anything that's treated with an antibiotic can develop resistance, mm -hmm. we're always vigilant. Um, there's a lot of research being done on how to stay ahead of the bacteria and what they can adapt yeah. to. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're, we've kind of covered everything, but I do want to ask either of you, like, is there anything like pressing like, that would be important to share or something <laughs> we haven't covered that you think should be a part of the conversation? Um, I think the most important part of this conversation is that by not talking about it, you're not preventing it. Um, the evidence never demonstrates that. Uh, mm -hmm. Talking about things actually helps eliminate some of the risks. Yeah. Because with knowledge is empowerment, yeah. right? Uh, we become more empowered to know what we can and cannot do um, to stay safe and to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. um, we do know in our area that there is a massive uptick in um, STIs, syphilis being one of them. The Virginia Department of Health does put out information pretty frequently yeah. about the uptick in, you know, just syphilis alone is at a 5,000% uptick in gracious. Virginia, which is really a lot. And yeah. I keep thinking, if somebody had had a conversation, if someone had been open and talked about it or had known how to practice safe sex and felt comfortable with it, you yeah. know, setting those boundaries and saying, you know, this isn't for me, um, you know, how much could we have prevented? But yeah. now, you know, when we know about syphilis, oftentimes it's, it's very late stages because, as I said before, it's silent. Yeah, and it's when they can no longer ignore it. They can mm -hmm. no longer push it aside. They have right. to come in, um, and that's too late to come in. <laughs> still come in, but um, <laughs> but I think that's important for I think our listeners to really take note of um, those who are watching in Virginia. Like, it is here. Like, mm -hmm. this is not something that's okay. happening in yeah. California. This is not something that's happening outside of where it can impact you. Like, it is here. It is prevalent. It is growing. Mm -hmm. So it's important to educate and prevent and to be a part of these conversations. Yeah. And I think kind of off the heels of what Tiffany was saying, you know, even us in healthcare. um, you know, it's really just changing that perspective, you know, removing that stigma around talking about it, um, going from more of like a disease model to more of like a health model, like let's yeah. promote sexual health, mm -hmm. you know, you know, outside of the individual, um, you know, impacts that STIs have, you know, there's a lot of big public health impact, you know, that they have, you know, they facilitate, mm -hmm. you know, transmission of HIV mm -hmm. um, throughout the community. They have, you know, dire consequences for, um, babies and maternal health as yeah. well. Um, so it's, it, it has a lot of negative impacts to our public health throughout our communities. Yeah. Um, and the more we can remove that stigma and start, stop looking at it, oh, you know, these are diseases, diseases. Yeah. Whereas these are, you know, these are infections, you know. Yeah. A lot of times, just asymptomatic infections that yeah. can have consequences. So right. how do we promote better um, sexual health the same way you know we've done the shift around mental health and talking yes. about that more um, how do we get um, sexual health to more of that state and I think that's a challenge for us in healthcare right now mm -hmm. and public health workers and yes. you know community yeah. um, health workers as well especially yeah. with our younger population yes and and when I think about that younger population I think about where even where we are geographically like we are in a more religious area where mm -hmm. sometimes these conversations are either taboo or they're just rejected because they're like, right. no, we have no design. We don't need to talk about that. Um, and it's so important to equip our kids who are going out into the world to know what to do in, in these mm -hmm. situations. And so um, thank you both. You guys have just given us so much information. <laughs> um, and I hope those of you who are listening, um, like dig in on this. And what are some resources that we can share? I know you mentioned World Health Organization, yeah. CDC. Yeah. Where can people find the most accurate information at this time? If you're looking for information about what's happening here in Virginia, the Virginia Department of Health has some really great resources. Okay. I really think that the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, yeah. CDC, has really approachable materials mm -hmm. to not only help you have these conversations yeah. from either a provider or a parent standpoint, but also has information there too for finding out a little bit more about how you can protect yourself. Yeah. And I think the CDC, they do a good job of um, having a good social media presence. Mm -hmm. So especially for our younger population, you know, CDC yeah. has um, you know, Instagram pages, Twitter pages, yeah. where they give out a lot of good information. I love um, that. 
which is you know, how a lot of our youth right now yeah. gets their information yeah. from social media. So That's so um, true. If it feels taboo to type it into Google, then just <laughs> follow them on Instagram <laughs> and let that just be a part of yes. your scroll periodically and <laughs> stay informed. Um, awesome. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I really appreciate your time. Thank um, you for and having thank us. you all for joining us on and so much more.